This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. Welcome to GenderCast episode 41. We're actually back together with Jax McNamara from the Icarus Project who participates in the radical mental health movement. And um, I actually just got to see Jax deliver a brilliant keynote this morning at the King County Behavioral Health Conference. So we're taking advantage of Jax being in town and getting them on the mic. I think we're just going to start with hearing a little bit about whatever you want to tell our listeners about yourself. And then we'll jump into the first question, kind of going into what radical mental health is. Thanks so much. Well, I identify as a white, genderqueer, mixed class background person, um, currently living in Oakland, California. I'm a poet and an artist and an activist and a gardener and chronically have too many things going on in my life because the world is really, really interesting. Jax does a lot of work and just from hearing them talk today at the conference, we have lots of ground to cover about um, all the different things Jax has been involved with. But can you talk a little bit about and kind of explain for our listeners what the radical, what radical mental health is and what the radical mental health movement is? And then maybe even talk a little bit about why we might want to talk about this on like a queer and trans podcast. So radical mental health. I mean, one thing is that radical mental health is not one thing. Radical mental health means different things to different people. I think that when we started using the word in the work that I do, it was kind of coming out of two places. One was that a lot of the folks I was organizing with consider themselves to be radicals um, or anarchists. And so looking at it from that perspective, bringing organizing around mental health into radical communities where in 2002 when I started doing this work there was not a lot of conversation about mental health but then also conversely putting mental health in a social and political context so looking at how does the world we live in how does oppression how does racism how does class how does capitalism how do all of these different things play into why people have experiences of emotional distress rather than what was at the time the prevailing model of mental health which was this very biologically focused you have a problem it is your brain chemistry it is inside of you you are a bubble walking around with a mood disorder or anxiety problems or whatever it is and never talking about emotional distress within the context of a sick and self-destructing world that sounds like maybe how you got involved and thought about the icarus project so um can you talk a little bit about the project and, and how it came about we started the icarus project in 2002 and the way that it got started was my best friend sasha altman de Bruel, who at the time i did not know this is how he became my best friend wrote an article that got published in the San Francisco Bay Guardian about his experiences with being diagnosed bipolar as someone who came from an anti-authoritarian background, who was a writer, who was a traveler, and a very fascinating human being that didn't really buy into the medical industrial complex and was extremely skeptical of corporate psychiatry, to be generous. And looking at, he kept losing his mind. and the drugs actually seemed to help keep him stable. And he really didn't know what to do with that information. Everything in his subculture said, you cannot take those drugs. They are evil mind control from the man that's designed to turn you into a clone. So he was really living in a lot of contradiction um, and wrote about this in a really compelling way. And I read it and just freaked out and was like, that's my life story. Who is this person? I was diagnosed bipolar when I was 19 after a number of years running around traveling and drinking and having giant escapades and adventures and I was a poet and I wanted to tear down capitalism and all kinds of things and you know was either a brilliant fascinating human being or like a total wreck and was trying to find some kind of balance and had also had very mixed experiences with these medications of sometimes finding them helpful, sometimes feeling like they erased my personality. And so I read these words and was just like, holy shit, I have to know this person and wrote him this giant email with my whole life story, which it turned out lots of other people were doing. And uh, all of these people, we thought we were the only ones with those particular stories. And it turned out we were wrong. And so Sasha and I decided that we had to create something where people could find each other 
and not feel so alone. And that we wanted to create something that was not only a network and a way for people to, you know, both discuss things on the internet and eventually meet each other in person, but also a media project. We really wanted to put out initially the book that we wished had existed for us when we were like 15 or 19. Because in 2002, when we started this, if you wanted to go read something about bipolar, your choices were like touched by fire. Basically, you read something by a psychiatrist who was also bipolar, like her memoir, which ends with like, and take your lithium for the rest of your life, or Patty Duke's autobiography. Those were like the two winning contenders. And we were just like, there has got to be something that is compelling and complex and beautiful and comes from a radical political perspective that talks about what it's like to live with these things and navigate them and try to find more creative frameworks for understanding our experiences. So we started the Icarus Project. Can you talk about what it means to hold an anti-oppressive analysis or approach to the mental health and psychiatric systems and the medical industrial complex? We've talked about the industrial complexes a lot on the podcast, but maybe even talk a little bit about what the medical industrial complex is. All right. So what it means to hold an anti-oppressive analysis while navigating the medical industrial complex. Yeah, it's rough, man. I mean, one thing for me that's been really important, and I know for a lot of other Icarus Project people, is being able to put into proportion what the function of those medical providers is going to be in your life. In terms of when you're a totally uninformed person who's just struggling like hell, you kind of get this idea that like the psychiatrists, that they're going to fix it all. That like this is where the answer is. And it's really easy to get incredibly disappointed when you're coming from that perspective because you go interact with them and a whole lot of psychiatrists are really belittling, have a ton of privilege themselves, race, class, educational, you know, have very little idea what your life is like. They've never taken the drugs they're prescribing and so they have no idea what it feels like to, you know. And so for me, it's been incredibly vital to reframe it and be like, okay, the psychiatrist, that person is just a gatekeeper. They are a gatekeeper to some pills that may or may not be helpful to me. So I need to do what I have to do to get through that gatekeeper and look for real healing somewhere else, you know, and look for real guidance somewhere else when necessary. Like when I'm really in a bad way, I'll take a friend with me to help advocate when I have to go see the psychiatrist or see other people who are within the mental health system. And that doesn't exactly speak to the anti-oppressive piece. I guess it speaks more to the just how to not lose it in the face of a lot of power that you don't have power over. And then there's the whole question of, you know, just being aware of the totally outlandish power that is at play in the medical industrial complex. And knowing that, you know, I am, a, as a white person, I'm pretty fucking lucky that with some of the places I have been in my mental health that I ended up in a psych ward and not in jail. And that's pretty much because I'm a white person with some class privilege. A lot of people in this country who are people of color would have ended up in jail. So being aware of those dynamics and knowing about like the differences and who gets which diagnoses. African-American men are way more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia than anyone else in the population. White people are, with similar symptoms are often way more likely to get diagnosed as bipolar. Women get the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, which is seen as like you're a throwaway if you've got borderline as far as clinical people are concerned. So there's just all this gross inequity, prejudice, systemic, structural violence within that system. And then one last thing I'll say is how a lot of people I know have navigated it is as much as possible trying to find help outside the system. But that really depends on having access to resources or living in a community where there are real sliding scale options. In the Bay Area where I live, there's a number of radical practitioners of different kinds of alternative modalities. And you can be someone who's not loaded and actually manage to get some help. That is not the case everywhere. I love this sound familiar. It sounds familiar. <laughs> Gatekeepers. Uh, you know, like, I think early also about, like, riders and, like, how 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, insurance companies building in riders for folks that needed mental health access and couldn't get access to covered 
prescriptions if they needed it or even i remember back in the day like my mom like we get five counseling visits a year for free and after that you know like just like now it's yeah. we have a different perspective and i feel like sometimes trans inclusive healthcare kind of takes on the same like you know projection and so we're not quite there yet but we're trying to build it in i feel like if you don't have a mental health diagnosis you can challenge like i, I have more advocacy to, to confront a mental health practitioner or a medical provider mm -hmm. and be seen as my arguments or my rationale is mm -hmm. legitimate versus trying to combat those structures and advocate for myself where someone could dismiss it as a part of my mental health diagnosis like so i think that like that's what i was thinking i don't know if because that's kind of what your the second feels like what does it mean to respond to these things and um ways that are sanctioned as crazy so i think about how do people respond to challenging some challenging Cultural. yeah like what's seen as normal in the sense of like the way we do things it must be another barrier in trying to advocate for oneself in the sense of like so easily dismissed by the powers that be and whatever they want you know yeah it's interesting the icarus project has gotten a lot of press over the years that we've been around and in the beginning, in particular, there was a lot of press where they would put in headlines to the effect of the inmates are running the asylum uh. was one of our actual headlines. And the articles ended up at some point giving us some respect, but, but there was this sense of like, whoa, the crazy people are talking back and talking about themselves, but they're really articulate and are they really crazy kind of thing. But yeah, they really wanted to see like whether or not they could discredit us for being crazy. And we're pretty confounded that we were people who have some pretty extreme stories. I mean, Sasha like has thought the whole world was ending and he was being broadcast live on primetime TV on all the channels and got picked up walking under the subway tracks in New York City. And it's not just like I was a little depressed and someone gave me Prozac. Some pretty extreme stories. And to walk in after having experiences like that and be really together and really having a political analysis and able to talk about it and providers and reporters not knowing what to do with that. So yeah, anyway, it just made me think about that. The inmates are taking over the asylum and um, and also just, just the way that it's a symptom. You know, if you want to point out sexism, patient is obsessing about X, Y, or Z, patient is paranoid, patient is concerned that people are disadvantaging them, you know, patient is obsessed with harassment, patient does not have self-awareness. I mean, you run the risks of all of that. It's like one of the most quoted examples of this kind of ridiculousness is in the 1800s when I think it was called draptomania, which was the diagnosis of slaves who want to be free. It was a psychiatric diagnosis that was given to runaway slaves and the treatment was flogging. Shit like that is real. Something that I always think about a lot is like Freud had sex with his patients and like did coke with them and psychology and psychiatry is like such a white, embedded in like white, cis, male, privileged culture anyway. And I feel like the way that the mental health system works, no one holds that analysis around. I mean, we, we have more conversation around like the jail and the prison system in the criminal justice system, but like to actually look at the mental health system that way. I don't get it. It's like crickets. I mean, and it's just so interesting, like when you bring up Freud. So <laughs> Freud's initial writings, he, in his initial writing, which got buried, attributed a lot of mental health distress and particularly women's mental health distress to early experiences of child sexual abuse. And people within the establishment basically we're like we we're gonna kick you out you can't say this like we're the ones doing it when you write about people's older male relatives messing with them like you're writing about us and our brothers and our friends and so that work of his which actually has some really useful stuff in it and if you look at the statistics of the number of female assigned people who were sexually abused at some point in their childhood i mean so who have mental health problems i meant to add so many like so many there's many studies many studies that like if you go in and you get certain kinds of major diagnoses you are way more statistically likely to have dealt with childhood sexual abuse like freud was on to something but he was on to something that the people in power were totally unwilling to listen to and so then he came up with all this crap about oedipus complexes and penis envy and penis envy right because it can't be that there was molestation it's got to be that she wanted to have a penis like it's all so gendered and sex from so far back
we've talked about this a little bit. Pathologizing mental health challenges has some similarities to pathologizing gender and gender nonconformity. And even within gender nonconformity and even within transness, people that don't conform to like a binary sense of gender. So I guess kind of one of the things I'm thinking about and wondering is sort of drawing that comparison of how mental health and certain ways that the that mental health challenges have been pathologized and kind of getting back to your dangerous gifts thing that you talked about this morning in the same ways that gender has been pathologized and maybe drawing some similarities between um, just sort of what you've what you've experienced maybe in the mental health system and then some of your thoughts around queerness and transness. Oh, there's so many places to start with that question. So one of the things that we often find in the Icarus Project and I've often found with the people I work with and organize with in radical mental health is, you know, we share a lot of similar traits. We might be really sensitive. We might have sort of lots of antennas out all the time taking in a lot of information that we can't quite filter all the way out. We might feel kind of like we never exactly fit anywhere. We don't fit with the normal people, we don't fit with the crazy people, we don't fit like where do we fit and what is our place and someone is always wanting to make us fit. You know when I first got locked up when I was 19 the doctor was so distressed that I was like a gay teenager and wanted me to change my lifestyle and everyone in my life back then well not my friends but my family the mental health system they really wanted me to fit into the box of like understandable teenager making good choices you know and i come from an upper, upper middle class white background so there's a certain understanding of what good white teenager means gender non-conforming freak was not that as was person given to like exuberant visions and grandiose thoughts and ideas and suicidal depression. Wrong box. But so I bring that up because I see this, this shared inability to fit into boxes as something both in populations with emotional distress and queer and trans populations. And that there's a lot of strength for us to be found when we're able to develop pride around that. I mean, there's a whole mad pride movement you know, along with queer pride. And one of the things that mad pride is modeling itself on is the gay pride movement. It's sort of like, okay, instead of you trying to erase our quote unquote mental illness, we actually want to celebrate our differences and how creative and interesting we are. Mad is short for madness. And it's a word that among certain people in that world has been reclaimed kind of the way queer has been reclaimed. Very much the way queer has been reclaimed. And we are messy and unplanned. Are you jealous? Are you jealous? I think it's really fascinating how we pathologize difference in this culture and how much distress comes out of that. You know, when I was a queer teenager getting locked up, I was like, my problem is not that I am gay. Like, my girlfriend is the best thing I've got going on in my life. My problem is how everybody else feels about me being gay. The shit that you say to me is my problem. The ways that you flip out about the fact that I shave my head or I wear men's pants. That's the problem. The fact that I wear men's pants is not actually a problem. So yeah, pathologizing of difference, it's so huge. And then, and it's just intense because it's like, and people are struggling and people want help, but in order to access help, do they have to accept a label? You know, just like with gender identity disorder, you know, you can't get access in our culture to certain kinds of psychiatric medication that can be helpful for certain things if you aren't willing to also accept a diagnostic label that goes with that medication. Or even if it's not about medication, it's just a therapist that your health insurance will cover. You know, you have to accept a label. And the truth is that like human beings throughout history have always struggled with extreme states of consciousness and emotional extremes. People have always dealt with grief. They've always dealt with psychosis. They've always dealt with anxiety. Like it's part, it's a natural part of human experience. It's not this added on pathology. And people want guidance, whether that guidance is coming from a priest or a doctor. But to require you to go through the fire of pathology to get there, 
It's really fucked up. It negates, like, even the idea of, like, exception and diagnosis. It's not like, well, I don't agree with that, but whatever. It's like that has real consequences and can, you know, impact how we move and navigate other things that we also need. And that label too, right? It's not the subjective. Someone gets to say this and I can move on tomorrow and it's fine. But it carries weight with it. Well, that and just, like, the internalized, that people internalize their the labels and you know, it becomes the thing that they are. I, and I guess that's the thing where I, I struggle watching because there's so much white supremacy and like classism and ableism and so many things at play just in the structures of the system that then to like, I, I guess that's where I was really connecting to your talk this morning, that connecting to like an analysis of those structures at play when you're actually trying to navigate the system and then kind of simplifying it down to like just seeing the doctor as like a gatekeeper to a certain thing that doesn't say anything about me or somebody that's experiencing whatever diagnostic label they're experiencing. Like in practice, how to actually help people do that, just especially people that have been sort of at the hands of the system for so long. I think it's just something we're all, we're constantly probably all going to be thinking about. Jax will read a little bit from their work and they'll talk a little bit about some of the public, the, the recent publication that they have right now and we'll kind of, yeah, bring you some snippets and readings. So I'm about to read a poem from my book In Between Land, which just came out in March on Deviant Type Press. It is a book full of queer poetry exploring everything from surviving trauma to gender to sex to love to politics, all kinds of things. And you can get the book online through my website or you can get it on Amazon. It's called In Between Land. So this poem is called Whether or Not You Fly. When I grow up, I want to be Brandy Carlisle. I want to sing to tear the roofs off houses and serve you up your own heart on a plate. When I grow up, I just want to feel at home in this boy-girl body, at home on 10,000-foot mountains, at home in my own bed. I want to navigate rush hour traffic with regular breathing, get along with my family, make love with my eyes wide open, and call down the rain when I come. When I grow up, I want to jump off every waterfall without ever having to flinch. I love you even if you can't jump. Even if you stand at the top of the cliff shaking, wishing for your mom even though she was so cruel. I love you in those moments when you can't speak, move, sing, jerk off, or smile. Those moments when you need to be small again. Small and held, not small and brave. I love you in those moments when you compare your hair to every other girl, your muscles to every other boy, when you look around the room and find yourself deficient because that is what you were trained to find. I love you with sand in your underwear after a wave knocks you out. I love you trying to pee when no one's looking. I love you unwitnessed, hungry, lonely, and done. I witness you. I witness you talking to that beat-up 11-year-old girl inside your own chest, the one who can't believe someone is finally listening to her. I witness you bring her glitter, ice cream, and daisy chains. I witness you describing the perfect getaway that never happened, the one where all your friends would come bust her out of the house and fly through the sky in a blue car like Harry Potter and land somewhere safe. Safe. Later. I witness you hiking alone twelve miles up and down ridges in the rain and the sun, anchoring your heels into the earth and your lungs to the sky, becoming part of the widest expanse of ocean you have ever seen. I witness you hitching the last ride down the mountain to the last plate of fried chicken in the last town at the edge of the colonized world. I watch you wake up the next day. Pray to the sunrise, press flowers in a book for your girl back home. I witness you wanting a family so bad you could taste it. I witness you hoping that this girl is the one. Hoping one day you get to plant the blueberry bushes you're both keeping in pots because you're waiting for them to root in the ground together. I witness you calculating budgets, debating careers, trying to paint love fucking make poems despite all the anxiety of hustling a life under capitalism. You are doing such a good job. You're making it. You adult, you dreamer, you kid, I see you when you count to three and you leap into the sky shrieking only to find when you land the water is actually deep enough to hold you. 
So that's in, in Jack's new book, In Between Land. So go to their website and get that, or you can find it on Amazon. So good. Kind of moving on from some of the previous topic, we'll kind of move into this next area. Can you tell us about taking a harm reduction approach to mental health recovery and what that means as far as medications and maybe talk about the guide Icarus put out around this? All right. So harm reduction approach to mental health and psychiatric medications. Well, first, I just want to say that harm reduction is an idea that comes from a lot of people before me who are really fucking smart and they're awesome and I got to give them credit. So harm reduction originally came out of movements for people who were trying to help out IV drug users and other folks who were struggling with addiction and were not finding the model of sobriety or nothing to be the most helpful. In concrete ways, it was looking at things like needle exchange programs, condoms if folks are going to get HIV so that they don't, or just ways to provide concrete things to make people's life experience safer. And on a more conceptual level, thinking about like, let's start where we're at. Like, meet people where they are. What can we do to improve the quality of life where people are? What kind of education can we provide that is, like, useful and in people's own language? How can we reduce the harm associated with risky behaviors? I think that it's a really useful model to apply to psychiatric medication. Because at the Icarus Project, we've wanted to be really careful. We're not an anti-psychiatry group. There are a number of anti-psychiatry projects out there. We're definitely not a pro-psychiatry group, but we see medication as a tool that is useful in some people's toolkits, a tool that is devastating to other people, that has a lot of consequences and side effects, but sometimes really works. And so how can we approach that tool recognizing that there's a risk, learning what those risks are, like actually having information about which meds are the worst to withdraw from before you start taking one? And how do you withdraw from one? How do you go off of these things safely? And if people are gonna be using meds, are there ways to use less meds? Because it's pretty fashionable right now, like for people with the diagnosis I have with bipolar, lots of people are on a cocktail of six meds a day. Pretty standard. So we look at, can you take fewer meds? Can you take the ones that are less harmful? If you're going to use the ones that are more harmful, can they be used like in acute emergency situations and then gradually discontinued rather than taking them for 20 years? Those kinds of things. Coming out of some of this stuff, and also because we just saw this glaring need for it, the Icarus Project created a harm reduction guide to coming off psychiatric medication. At the time, the only book that existed on coming off psych drugs was in Europe. I think it was it in England? It was really expensive, really hard to find. And it collected some people's personal stories, but it didn't have any systematic information about how to do this. And we were just like, dude, someone has to write a book on how to get off psych drugs. Like, we need this information in the world. So we decided that we were going to do it. Great way to piss off lots of doctors. (laughs) Um, Guide has medical advisors, and we consulted with all kinds of people. Will Hall is the main author of the guide. I helped write it. A bunch of other people contributed and you can download it for free off the Icarus Project website. So the next thing we wanted to ask you about is the role of creativity in your life. And we um, we had the poem earlier that one of your from your book just talking about how creativity has sort of helped you navigate and um, how you sort of see the role of creativity in the radical mental health movement. I'm actually going to start with the second part of that first. They relate those of us who started the Icarus Project came out of the DIY punk anarchist kind of subculture. And I want to be clear that I'm I'm talking about Icarus specifically because we're not the whole radical mental health movement. And there are other folks who have pretty radical approaches within mental health organizing who don't have that background, who maybe come out of more of like a human rights perspective, who've been doing activism for years around human rights or around globalization or some different things. So I'm going to talk right now specifically about the subculture Icarus came out of. And within that subculture, people are super fucking creative. And there's a real encouragement and glorification of like, if you have something to say, make a zine. You know, if you don't know how to draw, cut and paste a collage, make it happen, make mix CDs, make posters, make graffiti, wheat paste shit on the walls, like do things and make them beautiful and interesting. You know, like screen print a patch. It can be someone else's image that you stole. Who cares about intellectual property rights? Just put it out there in the world. And so that ethic has been super inspiring to us in the work that we've done. 
and it's something that we wanted to bring into mental health activism because when we started doing this mental health activism was a lot of things it wasn't very pretty <laughs> um there wasn't a lot of compelling things being made that you really wanted to look at and one of our goals has been to you know in our icarus mission statement one of our lines is about creating a new culture and language that resonates with our actual experiences and part of that creating a new culture was creating a new culture around this stuff that is like beautiful and inspiring and compelling and complex and so the art and the creativity have played a huge role in that in my own life i can't remember not being creative like my earliest earliest drawings go back to when i'm three and i started keeping a book of poems when i was six and i grew up in a really dysfunctional super troubled alcoholic home it was not not an easy place to be a kid to be kind about it and creativity really saved my life the only time that my parents would leave me alone if i wanted to be left alone was if i was writing or making art if i went up to my room and i closed the door and they called up for me and i said i'm drawing they'd leave me alone for whatever reason creativity was sacred when not much else was and so that was the place where i could go put the puzzle pieces together of my life or go fantasize about other worlds and try to draw those other worlds you know and making beautiful things totally got me through and is still incredibly important and this book that i just wrote I wasn't planning to write a book, I was just writing lots and lots of poems, and eventually someone asked me if I would make them a book and asked if they could publish it. And the process, I started the book right after my mother died, which was a horrible event in my life. She died really brutally and I witnessed it, and um, I was really traumatized. And so I started writing these poems as I was trying to recover from that. and the book sort of chronicles this journey through a lot of trauma and coming out of a period where I briefly tried to be straight. It was very unsuccessful and coming back into my queer self. And for the first time, like really stepping into that, really stepping into my queer body and into my polyamorous queer life and working through my shame around it and allowing it to be really present. And there's a lot of writing in this book that helped me to do that, that that's the place where I worked all of those things out and developed pride and analysis around them. So yeah, the creativity has been super important along with the mental health. All right, so this is a poem about coming into myself and coming out to the world as genderqueer. It's called Lung Seed. It was her idea to ask about my gender and it was my idea to lie to myself for a long time, except it was not my idea at all. It is the world's idea that we should lie to ourselves, that we should not find names for the experiences that don't fit in boxes. It's an idea that gets inside your own story until you think you made it up. To try to write this still stops my breath, my head threatens to detach like an agitated balloon lifting off a secret body. There is a terror to being broken, but there is a terror to never being known. She gave me my new name in November. When the days were filling with rain, it lived on one side of the bay, this name, for a long season of heavy soil and small rooms. In the spring, it began to bud out and scratch the inside of my throat, a lung seed becoming a tree, a language determined to grow. In June, I asked the world to use the name by emailing a fact to 93 people. It referenced flapjacks, famous hitchhikers, Wikipedia's take on third gender, and a dog named Jack from young adult science fiction who is as immune to psychotic outbreak syndrome as I one day hope to be. One day of euphoria and 30 days of shame, words burning visible across my chest, hunting through every gender book on Amazon for the things that made me spend the morning crying, genderqueer is on the spectrum of trans visualizing the ship of my body casting off from the harbor of woman into something uncertain and so much more vast spent the nights reading the things that made me come hard imagining a power between my legs i had never let myself own too much to speak almost enough to sing words became brittle words took on a shine words hung suspended between notes like raindrops on cobwebs like small bits of fabric caught in barbed wire fence everything is now open for investigation shoes hats hours 
pronouns, years. Sweating belly, hiding breasts, too few names for nowhere and nowhere left to rest. A city with a lake for a heart, a summer with fog for breath. We place our bodies behind microphones. We place our bodies on the street. Our bodies become words cast off from land, navigating silver, legible at the edge of day, glitter and the dark unknowing. We are the sounds of sex and bird calls, the shape of scars and clothing piled in corners, abandoned, redrawn. We are eyes opened in the morning to angel bones stacked up against a window, silhouette of change outlined somewhere between war and the future. So good. <laughs> Maybe you should just read your whole book on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so switching gears a little bit, can you talk a little bit about lending a disability justice lens to some of the radical mental health work you've done and maybe the work that you're doing within the Icarus Project? Disability justice. I am super, I'm super impressed with folks who have been developing a disability justice analysis. And I just want to put out there an honor that those folks are not me. Those folks, like disability justice has been grounded in the thinking and the analysis of mostly queer people of color. And beginning mostly with folks who dealt with various kinds of physical disability, but that's been greatly evolving over time and including people with invisible disabilities, quote unquote, chemical sensitivities, chronic illness, chronic pain, and now thinking more and more about emotional challenges and psychic impairments is a term that gets used sometimes. So I feel really indebted to some of the awesome people who have thought through this stuff before me. I am really interested in how we can bring some of the rubric of disability justice thinking into radical mental health. Historically, there hasn't been a ton of overlap. People in the radical mental health movement are very often completely uninterested in using language around disability for many valid reasons. You know, if you're talking about your emotional distress as caused by systems of oppression, why would you self-identify as disabled? You know, or if you're talking about your emotional distress as being a result of trauma and you're healing and you're in a process of healing, why would you talk about disability? Or if you've been given a lifelong psychiatric label like bipolar or schizophrenia, things that they say you won't recover from, and you are bound and determined, motherfucker, I am recovering, fuck you, why would you want to identify as disabled? But at the same time, there's some really powerful things within disability movements around loving and accepting the actual bodies and minds that we have and starting from a place of like this is who i am you know kind of an honoring difference thing you can look at it that way and a how do we create collective access as a community like what do we need to do to meet the needs of different minds and bodies so that all minds and bodies can be present and when you apply that, you know, and it's a lot easier to think about with things like if someone is a wheelchair user and building ramps, you know, it gets a little more complex when you think about it in terms of people with psychic impairments or mental health stuff going on, however they self-identify that language-wise. And I've actually wrote an article recently about this. It's called Access Intimacy and Mental Health, thinking about what does access look like when you're talking about mental health? Is it less stimulating environments? Is it space to debrief? Is it having a crew of people who are willing to go with you when you need an advocate at the psychiatrist's office? Um, is it limiting the size of gatherings? You know, just what are different things, different ways that we can make organizing spaces, performance spaces, other spaces accessible to folk who are in different places emotionally and psychologically? Because there's such pressure to pass. You know, if we want to bring in a metaphor that resonates with like the gender and the trans experience, there's such intense pressure in our society to pass as normal and able-minded, if you will. And internalized ableism around mental health stuff is so profound. It is so easy to hate and judge yourself for your depression or your whatever it is, you know. So getting back to disability justice. Um, so folks within disability justice have been cultivating... You know, so there's some things around like creating collective access and practical things like that, but also just really interesting intersectional political frameworks about how we understand different bodies and how they're valued and where they fit. And how do we understand different minds and where they're valued and how they fit? And how is the value of those minds changed by 
the body they're in and by the skin color of that body and the class background of that body and the gender identity of that body. So bringing all of that in and sort of moving beyond the disability rights framework, which is like we want to get equal access to the existing establishment into what kind of establishment do we want? Do we want an establishment or are we trying to build something totally different and transform the world we live in? And actually that's the goal is transformation. It's not just like give us our piece of the pie. Like we want a whole different pie. We want lots of fucking pies, <laughs> you know? So those are, those are some thoughts. And one last thing I'll say about that is, um, so this is an area that I've been actively doing some work on for the Icarus Project's blog. We have a blog with all kinds of different people writing and um, I put a, the article on access intimacy that I was talking about and then I've done an interview with Sins Invalid which is a performance project. Do you know them? Oh, you got to interview them. Sins Invalid is a performance project and political project based in the Bay. Um, specifically disabled artists and they specifically center gender non-conforming and or POC disabled artists and performances around disability and sexuality. They are amazing groundbreaking human beings doing such good work and they have a movie coming out. They made a movie of their shows that's coming out this fall so if you wanted to interview them in conjunction with their movie release it would be timely and I can give you their contact info. Digression. But anyway, so putting up exciting new writing about disability justice on the Icarus Project website and trying to draw those. We are sort of home to digressions here. That um, makes me think about our disability justice episode that we did and I think ties into it really nicely too. So I'm glad that you mentioned a lot of the stuff that you did because that's, we did a whole episode around that and we just touched into sort of more invisible type disabilities and I think you talked about it a little bit more in a way that um, people can relate to and, and understand. As we kind of sign off, is there any other projects that you want to highlight or things you're really interested in that you want folks to know? And is there anything like books, zines, um, projects that are going uh, on with the Icarus Project that you want folks to know are coming up or, or to get a hold of? All right, well, I'll start with Icarus and be brief and then talk about some other projects and groups that I think are really interesting. Um, so Icarus right now, we are in a period of sort of internal rebuilding. We lost all of our funding in 2009 and just got refunded. So we're sort of rebuilding our organizational infrastructure. That's where a lot of our energy is going. Putting together an advisory board and just be rebuilding a lot of things. We're also rebuilding our whole website, which is based on archaic technology from 2005. Um, yeah. And working on developing a mentorship network, which is one of the programs we're really excited about. Hooking up people with mentors who have like been going through mental health challenges longer than they have. And a number of other potentially awesome things are in the work. But the main things right now are our revitalized blog, where we're publishing a bunch of new articles. And then the development of the mentorship network and local groups. I don't know. There's always a lot going on with Icarus. And we reissued all of our publications this year, now that we got refunded. So all of our publications are back in print and we put out a 10 year anniversary edition of Navigating the Space Between Brilliance and Madness, which has a bunch of new content. So if folks wanna check that out, it's beautiful. So some other projects I'm really excited about. Oh, there are so many. Um, really excited about the Brown Boy Project. Mm -hmm. We've interviewed, yeah. You've interviewed them? Yeah. They're so cool. Um, for folks who haven't heard about them all. Yeah. Yeah. The Brown Boy Project is a project based out of the Bay Area um, for masculine of center folks, POC, build community and build skills and build their general awesomeness as agents of change in the world. Um, and they just put out last year a really cool guide to health for brown boys which has so many good resources. And it even quotes the Icarus Project. Oh, does it? I was so touched. I have it. I'll have to you like have it? Ourselves one. Yeah, yeah it's so good. So they are doing fantastic work. I am really excited about some of the people doing healing justice work right now in the U.S. There's the Healing Together Network, which came out of last year's Allied Media Conference. And um, that's working on putting together sort of a radical healers network across the U.S. And then there's also the Radical Healing Babes or the Badass Visionary Healers Collective based out of Oakland. Another awesome healing justice collective with the best name ever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I already mentioned Sins Invalid. And then another organization and project that's near and dear to my heart is Generative Somatics. Um, somatics is S-O-M-A-T-I-C-S for people who aren't familiar with it. And 
Generative Somatics is an organization that kind of has two branches of what they do. One is offering trainings to people who want to become practitioners of somatics, working through the body to help folks with trauma and stress from a social justice grounded orientation. And then they have a branch where they help different people in social justice movements bring somatics into how they organize. So they work with the National Domestic Workers Alliance. They work with all kinds of people bringing somatics into like leadership building. They are fabulous human beings. And one of the more exciting sort of healing radical projects that I know about, there's a really good disability justice collective here in Seattle. I don't know, there's so many people I could talk about, but that's what's occurring to me right now. So we'll post links to everything that you talked about, but do you have your own personal website you want to give a shout out to where people can find your book? Because I know that that's a fairly new publication that you're trying to get out there and you sold out today at the conference. So yes. Yeah, I have a website that's like my art, design, writing, books, events, tours, workshops, the whole deal. Um, The web address is redwingedjacksbird.net. It's like Red Wing Blackbird but it's redwingedjacksbird.net. Although if you just Google Jax McNamara, it's the first thing that comes up. Well, thank you so much for taking time to sit with us and do this conversation even after you did a keynote this morning. It's been a long day. So we definitely appreciate you coming on the podcast and we're excited for everyone to hear this and we'll post all the links and hopefully you'll, if if you want to contact us at GenderCast, we'll make sure that we pass anything along to Jax um, if you don't find them on your own. Thank you so much for being here. I also just want to give a shout out to the listener that actually wrote a, wrote to GenderCast and was like, hey, I would love to hear. <laughs> Through that listener kind of writing in, we connected with you and we're lucky enough that you were kind of on your way to Seattle within a few months. So in that <laughs> vein of thought, for folks out there, we just did our last episode um, and thinking about next year's topics. So if you have folks in your community that you think are awesome and you'd like us to get a hold of or reach out to, we're always you know, up to connect with different folks that we don't have you know, direct knowledge of here in Seattle. So again, thanks to that listener and we appreciate it. And thanks so much for taking time out. I know it's been a long day and um, I'm excited to air the episode. It sounds really awesome. That's episode 41. So what is it? GenderCast signing off. We're signing off. Copyright 2012 GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. All podcasts, content, and information related to these podcasts are the property of GenderCast producers and may not be used without their written consent. Contact GenderCast at gmail.com for written permission. I am just one into this world, but what the world might see isn't always me. Cause inside is a boy trying to break free. body or my soul he just wants to share this body make me whole cause the girl this world does see is only half of me i am not the only one born under this golden sun beneath the surface you will find The million thoughts that cross my mind I am born into this world brand new Start with knowledge small, takes time to learn it all Learn to live, leave it all behind Accept the different and find the peace of mind make us who we are and what we know some of us are scared to let it show let it out scream this is me now it's time that the whole world sings